need to rethink what's fair and, and, and just in a society where platforms and technology are taking over more and more parts of society. So the next speaker has a very interesting vision and take on that. It's Fredrik from the Union that thinks that in a platform society, unions need to be platform too, and they need to be powerful and just. So please, give it up. Fredrik, Union. <laughs> Hello, as Ola said, my name is Fredrik Soderquist and I'm an economist at Unionen, which is Sweden's largest trade union in the private sector. Uh, we are a white collar union and we represent over 620,000 members in Sweden, of whom 10,000 are self-employed. Now, today I'm going to talk a little bit about economic history and structural change. And as an economist, you know, you have to handle these things in a certain way. Uh, so I have some sources on the bottom. If some of them are wrong, please let me know afterwards. I should start by saying, before I forget, that we have a workshop at 1. It might be pushed a little bit now that we're behind schedule. But if you have more questions and you want to discuss more, please come there. Because there's so much to say about this, and I only have 10 minutes. So let's get started. So, uh, I mean, what's really interesting about CIME, as you have talked about, I know, in the past couple of days, is that you know, IT questions and, and digitalization has gone from being a small, nerdy issue to an issue that covers society as a whole. And it's called, you know, by many, a fourth industrial revolution. Now we need to think, and uh, this is, you've, maybe a lot of you have read Eric Brynjolfsson and Eric McAfee's book, The Second Machine Age. If you haven't, you should. It's really good because it puts this structural change we're in the middle of in a really good historical context, I think. Because really, what was the big deal about the industrial revolutions, right? I mean, someone came up, or some people came up with innovations that were used. But the really big deal about these industrial revolutions was that they changed the way that work is organized. I mean, what was the big deal about the steam engine? It was not just a more powerful and re reliable power source, but it actually enabled us to organize work in factories. So instead of working out in the countryside, in the cottage industry, Work was gathered in a central place, and from that, huge economic gains were made. The second industrial revolution was kind of the same thing with the electrification of industry. It didn't only mean that you had a much cleaner, more powerful you know, power source, but eventually they figured out that, hey, what if we put all these machines in a row and start producing stuff more scientifically? That was a, so, so electrification was actually a big deal in that way, that it enabled a new way to organize work. So what I'm here to talk about today is the platform economy, or the sharing economy, as many people call it. That's a word that no one is really, really comfortable with, because it's, it, from the beginning, perhaps, it was about sharing. It was about creating meeting places where strangers could establish trust in one another and exchange goods and services. But when you are actually selling stuff, maybe it's not so much about sharing anymore. And the scholar Arun Surandarayan, who writes you know, is one of the most cited scholars in this field. He, uh, he doesn't like the word sharing economy, but he names the, his book sharing economy. I don't know why he does that. I think it's because he wants to uh, know, people want to buy the book and they know what they're talking about. He calls it crowd-based capitalism. And this is what's really interesting. Uh, because the platform is actually a really cool way of a new and interesting way of organizing work. It's, if we go back, actually, you think about the phone. I mean, what does the phone do? It's, it's a collection of technology that's been the smartphone of, you know, these consumer products we've had for 20, 30 years all gathered in one place. And now the combination of that technology is being used to organize work. We're no longer, we, perhaps we are no longer dependent on gathering in offices or factories in order to have work carried out. But you know, again, with definitions, it's pretty hard. I mean, what is a platform? I think The Economist had a really good definition the other month when they wrote about this. It's a marketplace where people and businesses trade under a set of rules set by the owner. And, but the role of the platform in order to be successful is to reduce transaction costs. How do you make it easier to access these goods and services that the platform is providing? But then, again, I mean, platforms, we've, there's, you know, it's a very broad word, and we are today very dependent on a number of very big platforms, right? 
you know, search engines, social media, all of that, they are dominated by a few platform players. And the reason for this is there's a network effect to platforms. The more people who are on a platform, the more people it will attract. You can, in theory, create a new platform, but it's going to be very hard uh, to be successful if you don't get a lot of people on board, right? So there's a strong tendency towards monopoly in these markets. And these are, I mean, this is from last month. It's from October. It's a Bloomberg. They looked at the numbers. But this is the, big, the five biggest firms in the world set by market capitalization. And they are all in some way dependent on a platform and are definitely dominant in that relevant market where that platform is operating. So this is where we get more union in now, right? Uh, I'll try to sum this up uh, in the part, last half of my presentation now. So when we get back to industrialization, the society structure was changed. And a lot of people were not benefiting from this and did not like this. So a first approach was on your top left here, was to destroy the technology that was changing your life for the worse, right? These were Luddites. Uh, and this was, you know, it was very, very socially unrestful time in the 19th century up till the 20th century. Uh, and then, oh, it's a bit spooky for your entrepreneurial types, but these guys had some analysis about this, about the fact that the, the, the gains that come out of new ways of producing things, if they are not spread out well, people are going to get angry. Now, I mean, they are controversial mainly for their suggestions to solutions. I mean, this is why they are still a bit scary, spooky today. I mean, the, the, pro, the dictatorship of the proletariat, etc. Uh, but in a lot of Western countries, there was a more, you know, they didn't go on the Marx and Engels line. They went, or Lenin or Mao or whoever you want to bring up there. There was actually a compromise reached. And this is where trade unions get in. And this is in Sweden then. And what happened after this big unrest, growth became more equitable. So many of the gains that were made in society were spread out more in society. So a middle class could arise, and from that, a lot of other economic gains came. And this is, you know, Saltsjöbads of Talet in Sweden. And you can ask me at the, at the workshop later what that was. But this is where the Nordic countries were different from many other places, because this inequitable growth, there was some intervention at the beginning of the 20th century in most Western countries. The difference with, between Sweden and many other countries is that the social partners, labor and capital, employers and trade unions, themselves worked out the rules. How do we make growth more equitable and how can we coexist peacefully? So in the picture on the right here, there's no politicians. So this, you know, and, and this has meant that we, and this model has been successful, where most other countries have failed. So one thing, if you look at the Nordic countries, is that, you know, income inequality is a question everyone is discussing, and the fallout from that, you know, you can interpret Donald Trump in many different ways, but maybe that is one factor, that people have not received any wage increases in 20 years, the bottom 90% of the population. But, what, what, I mean, what is the cause? Why is income inequality increasing? The IMF, which is not a leftist institution by any means, discussed this. Everyone thinks that everyone knows that income inequality is bad for growth. But they see, they see trade union density as the number one factor that, show, that, that explains why income is concentrating to the number, to the top parts of the population and not. So basically, in the Nordic countries, there are, income inequality is not as bad here, and it's because of trade unions. And it's not just because we can extract wages from the growth and distribute it among our members and non-members, but it's also because our labor market institutions are rigged in a way that is really beneficial to our members. And that means that firms can fail, and our members will be taken care of and can get on to another job. And yeah, here's some numbers on how trade union density is developed in some Western countries, and then we have the Nordics on the right. So now we get to the platform economy. I mean, a platform can be a boss. And the fact, I mean, if you don't have a boss, why are you going to strike? And there has been some very interesting strikes we'll talk a bit more about uh, at the workshop, I think. Uh, but this, this is, I mean, the, it's, the platform economy is very small at the moment. It's only a small fraction. I think in Sweden we saw a number of 12% of Swedes have worked at platforms, but they do it in a very small degree. And I think the, rev the total turnover for the platform economy in Sweden is like the consumption of pears or pizza or something like that. 
But we think that because this is an organizational innovation, it will spread and it will grow. So this is the, you know, the American Union approach. Don't panic, organize. But I don't know if that seems very sustainable. You're chasing away you know, the, the capital. Uh, so we made a, a Swedish version. You know, we, we really like agreeing with each other. We have to compromise or else we'll get very upset. <laughs> so uh, I'll try and sum up really quickly. We have a report, you can co come to our stand, which is out by the bar, uh, where we have an idea how this self-regulated Swedish labor market model can be adapted to the platform economy as a whole. And we know that regulatory issues is a very difficult issue for platforms, many of whom are startup companies, small companies. Uh, so what we want to do is create an institution which makes it possible for all types of regulation in Sweden to be more adapted and transitioned to a, a more digital labor market. And I think I will finish with that. Uh, thank you all for listening and please come to our workshop if you have more questions and want to discuss more. Time is up.